Good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, crucial panel that we are going through, you know, tough times, especially as Palestinians. Uh, I first would like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the Temecula Valley, in, which sits on the unceded um, land, indigenous land of the Pichanga tribe of the Louisiana First Nation. Um, and I acknowledge my presence for, within the colonial system. So I was asked to talk about my connection to the issue or the topic of the Palestinian struggle or Palestine through my research. And um, I consider myself as, a, as an activist scholar. So my research actually is very connected to my activism and is very connected to my service to my community as well. I uh, think, you know, if, if, what I want to highlight is probably my journey in terms of um, you know, evolving as a scholar, um, an indigenous scholar, of course, uh, from a very uh, Eurocentric, you know, approach to research and science into decolonizing actually uh, my approach to my research. And it's, it, was, um, it wasn't an easy uh, process. It wasn't an easy uh, evolution. It took me actually over 20 years uh, to reach where I am now. Um, and it's not the end, of course, you know, it's just actually uh, one phase in, in the whole process of decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production. Uh, but, you know, I came to the United States as a Fulbright scholar. And um, as I said, I was still, even as a Palestinian, impacted by uh, the Western paradigm of, uh, of knowledge production. And I had to, you know, engage in a lot of soul searching and a lot of, um, you know, ontological and epistemological, you know, uh, journeys towards what I'm looking for and, and how I want to approach it. And um, I did a lot of research at the beginning as a junior scholar on critiquing the media and its representation and misrepresentation, of course, of Arabs, Muslims, and especially Palestinians and the very static images and stereotypes. And then I reached a point that one important element of deconstructing this structure of misrepresentation should be actually to go towards more knowledge production in general, but also media production. And this is how I started my long journey actually in uh, film production. And um, it started from my research in the Palestinian refugee camps. I uh, started the conceptualization, conceptualization process in 2003, but uh, the actual fulfillment of my uh, ethnographic research, critical ethnographic research was in 2006 when I actually got grants, took my, my film equipment with me because I wanted to make a short video on Palestinian refugees and their narratives of diaspora or Shatat or Nakba. Went to Syria, then Lebanon, and then I got stuck because of the war, the Israeli war on Lebanon. I, my research was interrupted, obviously, and I had to come back. And I wanted to go back in 2008, uh, but then I met my co-producer, co-director Andy Trimlett, who convinced me to actually focus more on the year 1948 and its catastrophic um, consequences on the Palestinian nation, uh, you know, as a result of the creation of the state of Israel and uh, the ethnic expulsion of over uh, half of the Palestinian population at that time. So um, that took me on, uh, 10 year journey actually in pre-production and production and post-production. And we, you know, at that time, of course, we didn't realize that it would like take us all that time, but it did. And it was a very tough project, you know, um, that was very hard to complete. We faced so many obstacles until we released the film in 2017 and we pre premiered it at the Arizona International Film Festival. I think I could talk about all the obstacles, but I think the major obstacle which I would like to focus on in this, uh, you know, uh, spirit of decolonizing knowledge is the fact that we couldn't get access to information. Information on the whole issue of Palestine, this Palestinian struggle, the creation of the state of Israel is under the control of the Israeli colonial system. Uh, so just just briefly, because I know I don't have a lot of time and I'm going to show uh, the short clip from my film or the trailer, you know, the short trailer. Um, Israel, uh, since its inception, you know, started this process of putting its laws. And one of them was the information law, the Israeli information law. And actually, 
Uh, that led to the embargo law on information, which led to basically de to, to classifying the majority of information on the creation of this, the state. So anything related, for example, to the destruction of over 450 Palestinian towns and villages uh, in the process of the creation of the state, uh, the expulsion orders, you know, by the Israeli militias that, the, well, it wasn't militias, you know, the Jewish militias, you know, the Zionist militias in Palestine, all of that, everything related, pictures, documents, the majority of that information is actually still classified, you know, uh, according to, to the Israeli. Well, at that time it was classified and it was supposed to be declassified after 50 years. So at the end of 1998, this is when we had the, you know, uh, you know, all the literature that came out of what we term as the new Israeli historians like Benny Morris, Ilan Pape, et cetera. But unfortunately, because of their publications and talking about basically what we consider as Palestinians, the genocide, the continuous genocide against Palestinians, uh, the Israeli government went back and classified, reclassified a lot of the information that they declassified uh, in 1998. And actually there was a lot of legal cases, you know, in Israeli courts to, declassify information, not declassify them until, you know, um, the Israeli government decided to extend the embargo by another 20 years. And then after that, just, you know, in 2019, the Netanyahu government decided to extend it to 90 years. So imagine we're talking about knowledge production when the majority of information we need, right, to understand the historical context that still impacts the, the present, um, all the information needed for that, you know, uh, writing or rewriting history, or, you know, reclaiming the narrative as uh, Edward Said taught us, you know, in the post-colonial school, all of that would not be uh, accessed until the year 2038. And the question is, of course, you know, why? What is being hidden, right? Why, why is it crucial that for uh, 90 years, and, and I don't know if we will have access in 2038, if we are still alive, uh, you know, why is this embargo still going on for 90 years? What is being hidden? The majority of information we need is still hidden. I, I, I wanted actually to invoke this conversation by starting asking this question. And uh, in spite of everything, we managed to put together a film based on interviews with Palestinians, Israelis, and the most famous historians. Um, I think I'm allowed to share the screen. Let me see. Just one second. Sorry. Um, I apologize, it's gonna take me a second right now. All right, can you all see it? I, I can't see anyone, sorry, so somebody has to tell me if you can see it or not. Yes, I can see it, yep. Okay, Easy. hopefully you can hear it also. And you found yourself in a moment, in a moment, losing everything. The feeling of you have a state of your own, a Jewish state, oh. No one can, no one have ever lived such a situation. ואז ברגע מסוים כנראה החליטו לגרש את הערבים משם, וגירשו אותם, ואנחנו ראינו את זה. They took the elder member of the family. He was maybe at the time, maybe he was 70 years old. And the soldier took his wallet. I remember this very, very well. So anyway, they took more than the wallet. They took everything. Right. Um, so basically uh, to conclude, to understand what is happening today in Gaza, to understand what is happening in Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Al Khalil, um, everywhere in Palestine, you know, in Al Lid, Ramle, we really have to link that to the historical colonization of Palestine that's still going on until today. 
You know, what happened in Lut, for example, in our segment, we show actually the very clear expulsion order of all the population, Palestinian population out of Ramla and Lut. Uh, that's one example. Uh, the other example is that about 85% of the people in Gaza, the population of Gaza is actually refugee who were ethnically expelled from them, their lands in 1948. So that's very important to understand the historical context is to understand the present. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to um, move on to, to Mohammed. Uh, thank you. Uh, this time, uh, I would like to just focus on Jerusalem uh, in the heart of the Palestinian-Israel conflict. As we know that uh, the problem, uh, you know, uh, 11 days of wars, uh, Sheikh Jarrah and Al-Aqsa, and then uh, uh, the attacks of Gaza, uh, basically is focused on Jerusalem. And as we know, uh, Sheikh Jarrah is in East Jerusalem. This is for students and us who uh, are not familiar enough to the, uh, to the map. It's uh, basically a property dispute, but of course the occupation and this is the general mainstream narratives among the Palestinians as well as the Israelis that we keep uh, listening to and hearing about, and this is going nowhere. So you have these competing claims among the Palestinians, among the Israelis, uh, which is uh, one of the, perhaps one of the um, barriers to any peace process. So the Palestinians, you know, the creation of the state of Israel was at the expense of the Palestinians. The indigenous Arab population has been systematically discriminated against since the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which created Israel for the Jews at the native population, which has been denied its own nationhood and become a dispossessed marginalized people. On the other hand, the Israeli general mainstream uh, narratives over the centuries, the Jews have been exposed to hatred and violence in many of the countries where they have settled. What could be more justified than the creation of a homeland for the Jews in the land of their origins, Israel, a state where Jewish national identity can be recognized and where the inhabitants can finally be saved from persecution. So these mainstream narratives, the competing claims that are until the present day, so we have three major holy sites, as we know, uh, Western Wall, the Haid al-Buraq, as part of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And we have the Christian, especially the Orthodox Catholic Christians, the Church of Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem. And we have, uh, of course, Al-Haram uh, al-Sharif, uh, where you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, Muslims believe Prophet Muhammad prayed toward this site before uh, Kaaba in Mecca. Of course, the Dome of the Rock, uh, Qubba al shakra uh, on the Temple Mount or Al-Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem, where Muslims believe as the uh, site of, uh, you know, the first creation of human beings and also where Abraham tried to sacrifice his son and uh, Prophet Muhammad's night journey to heaven uh, started from the rock at the center. So basically, these holy sites become the center of uh, the conflict, especially uh, re with regard to the status of uh, Jerusalem. The key issues since 1967, uh, um, there, there are five of them, uh, de facto political annexations. So Israeli states uh, claim it is a legitimate act, uh, while Palestinian would say it's the denial of Palestinian claims of national and territorial rights in East Jerusalem. Then we have the issue of exclusive ideology uh, among many Israelis, the state of Israel sees Jerusalem as fundamentally Jewish city, while at the same time, the Palestinians and the Arab Palestinians would see this is eroding the Palestinian identity and presence in East Jerusalem. Then, of course, the land acquisition and the construction of Israeli settlements, uh, and also the, the, the issue of administration of the Holy City, who control, who governs, who administer the Holy Sites. On the one hand, the Israeli claims that it is their protection and it is for everybody. It is open city, access to all the holy cities. 
but at the same time, uh, it uh, denies some autonomy among non-Jewish groups in, uh, in East uh, Jerusalem. And of course, the separation wall, uh, separating East Jerusalem from the West Bank. Uh, of course, the Israelis say it is a self-defense, uh, but then of course, uh, for many, uh, especially the Palestinians, it is a barrier cutting off the Palestinian freedom of movements, economic freedoms, uh, access to education, culture, and so on and so forth. So Jerusalem has been uh, the center of conflicts and peace process. To make it short, uh, we have, of course, two set state solution and one state solution. But one of the things that I think need to be uh, reminded about is the informal Geneva Initiative 2003, which affirmed Palestinian sovereignty over the Haram Sharif. So that's the part of the Muslim part. And then the Israeli sovereignty over the Mount of Olives and the Western Wall. And then a special regime for the old city. And then you had, uh, or you have a third party intervention, United Nations, uh, UNESCO and monitoring religious body. That's the mainstream uh, political suggestion, but you also we have also alternative models which tend to be marginalized. One state solution, which is basically a shared sovereignty and you have an independent entity in Jerusalem, an extraterritorial um, that uh, nobody would claim or sovereignty over. That's it from my presentation. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed, for that um, great uh, sort of, sort of Set, a set of introductions. Um, I'm going to turn over. Could you repeat that? I think we just missed it. <laughs> Sorry, um, I just said I'll, I'll turn over to, to Michael now. Great, thank you. So um, I'm Michael Alexander. I hold the Maimon I'm hold the Maimonides Chair in Jewish Studies at UCR. I teach classes about the state of Israel. I'm always glad to work with our Middle Eastern Islamic Studies faculty. Today is my first event with the Middle East Student Center under the direction of Omar Aziz. And while I'm always glad to learn from colleagues and students about Islam in the Middle East, including the place of Jews in that conversation, I don't think any of us are happy about our subject matter today. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about the Oslo process of 1993 to 1995 which has been the most successful negotiation between Palestinians and Israelis to date. It was certainly incomplete, uh, but the progress it made leading to Camp David summit and the Taba summit that uh, Mohammed just mentioned, where the borders based roughly on UN resolution 242 were in sight, uh, that's the closest that we've come to an agreement. It did include full Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, including the Christian and Muslim quarters of the old city. And they got very close to this. At some points in the negotiations, the uh, Palestinians left. Finally, uh, at, at the top agreement, at the top of moment, the Israelis left the table, but they were they were in sight of that of, of that moment of that possibility. Uh, it began with conversations between academics, and it ended with talks and agreements between Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. And it had a very interesting initial ground rule that was agreed upon by both sides. They agreed not to talk about grievances of the past. They decided only to talk about how to fix the future. Now for the history buffs among us this morning, that might sound like sacrilege. And it's certainly not the case that the negotiators didn't know the history. The problem was they knew it all too well. They all had lived through the violences, many, many years of them. And so why did they decide together that looking backward was not in the interest of moving forward? Uh, the problem with harping on the past is that there are too many grievances with too many justifications from too many sides. The history of who's at fault is like a knot. Who started what? Both sides have an opinion, always. In every incident, both sides have an opinion about who started it. Who is legitimate and who isn't? Both sides have their opinions. Who belongs where and who doesn't belong there? Who's the original and who's not? That kind of a tit-for-tat discourse with which we're all too familiar produces a kind of giant Gordian knot, so complicated, it never gets untangled. One side tugs this way, the other side tugs that way, one says you did this, the other says, but you did that, and they're only pulling the knot tighter by, uh, by taking, make it, taking these positions. In my view, both sides very often can be seen as right. I mean, both of them can be seen as right at the same time. It's just the nature of human knowledge 
that it's multifaceted. And every time the sides take independent positions defending how they are right, the knot gets pulled tighter. The Oslo negotiators weren't just tired of going over the same old arguments, they knew it wasn't helping to move anything forward. TikTok, Twitter, one-sided panels that we're all too familiar with, they pull the knot tighter, which is mostly why I'm very grateful for being invited to this panel, not to give the Israeli side or to defend Israel, but to try to participate in conversations that try to imagine how to move forward. At Oslo, they understood from many years of experience that after the verbal tit for tat comes the violent tit for tat. I won't go through all the violences except to say that both sides feel justified in what they do, and it leads to more fear, more death, no progress whatsoever. All of us can see that 2021 in Gaza is almost an instant replay of 2014 in Gaza, because all that's occurred in the intervening years since Oslo really is shouting in silos, echo chambers, and both sides building up their independent positions. So how does one cut through this Gordian knot of finger pointing? I think that we can take a clue from the civil rights strategy implemented by Martin Luther King. The population that Dr. King represented faced enormous violence with a long history of grievance. It had plenty of right to be angry with white people, to be afraid of white people, to disdain white people. They had centuries of reasons to believe that they could find no partner in white populations. And yet much of the genius of Dr. King was to look at the raw demographics and to realize that American Blacks simply needed white people to switch to the African-American cause. King could see that he needed white people to be on his side of the, on his team. He had to create the opportunity for white people to become part of the solution. And he achieved the greatest movement forward in American civil rights since emancipation uh, proclamation by doing exactly that. And I hope you see my point here. Palestinians need Israelis in order to move forward, period. And Israelis need Palestinians in order to move forward, period. They simply do. There is no other way forward. And that is what the Oslo negotiators seem to have realized, that they needed one another. And so they were willing to explore trust building measures to get there. It took incredible strength and courage for both Rabin and Arafat to look beyond the past towards a better future. Both Arafat and Rabin realized ex ex with extreme clarity that they faced civil war at home in ignoring the old grievances and attempting to move forward together as partners in peace. And Rabin paid for it with, with his life by being, by, by being murdered by a Jewish nationalist. Over the last decade, <clears throat> teaching about the state of Israel at UCR, I've had Jewish students, I've had Palestinian students, Egyptian, Iranian students, all sorts of students, some with no personal relationship to these conflicts, and they just enroll out of curiosity and care. I'm sure that all the faculty have had this kind of experience as well. Many kinds of students, I hope, are taking all of our classes. In my own, I teach, uh, I do teach a lot of history, not so that each side can feel justified in its positions, but so that each side can see that justification alone has not created a better political reality for anyone. The only movement forward has been through partnership. Let me say it again. The only movement forward in the long history of the conflict has been through partnership. This is not a situation where ethnic cleansing will work. Besides the moral disaster of ethnic cleansing, in this case, it isn't even practical. Millions of Palestinians aren't going anywhere. Millions of Israelis aren't going anywhere. In fact, one of the most interesting and I think promising aspects of the last round of trouble is that Palestinian Israelis are refusing to be taken for granted, millions of them. Also promising is that moderate Israelis are utterly shocked by the extent that the right-wing nationalism has hijacked government policy and led directly to Palestinian Israeli protests. These two populations, Israeli Palestinians and moderate Jewish Israelis, are now talking to each other more and more often. They're organizing together. I personally follow a lot of these groups, uh, Jews and Palestinians together. They are, they, these groups are gaining strength. They are trying to transform the silos and the echo chambers into conversations and ultimately agreements. And that's why I'm so pleased to have been invited to this panel organized by the Middle East Student Center. 
and the faculty of Middle East and Islamic studies. The fear is always, <clears throat> excuse me, the fear is always that violence from the extremes will derail this kind of real conversation. And there will always be those who prefer to shout in their silos and listen to themselves. But there is a new kind of bravery and courage recognized and implemented by people of both sides. It's the courage to look forward beyond grievance and toward partnership in a shared future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alexander. Um, and next we will have um, Reza Aslan. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me just begin by apologizing for this the cynicism that uh, is it's hard for me to overcome at this point. Um, 11 years ago, uh, after I think it was maybe my second or third trip uh, to Israel Palestine, I wrote an op ed for NPR, saying that the we should stop talking about the fiction of the two state solution, that any dream of a two state solution uh, is long dead. And not dead, really, but murdered, truly. And that there are plenty, pl plenty of blame to go around. You know, there's plenty of murderers. Uh, certainly, you could blame the uh, geriatric Palestinian leadership, uh, whose corruption and ineptitude have essentially forfeited the trust of the Palestinian people. You can certainly blame Hamas and uh, its fellow militants, their terrorist activities, their hostile takeover of Gaza have made the notion of a united Palestinian state difficult to even fathom. You can most definitely blame the enormous growth in the number of Jewish ideological settlers uh, whose thirst for more land have made it next to impossible for Israel to even consider the possibility of dismantling the settlements and returning to anything even remotely like the, the 67 borders that the Oslo um, uh, Accords that um, Professor Alexander was talking about, the Oslo negotiations were envisioning. You can <laughs> blame the successive Israeli governments uh, that have pandered to these groups and certainly the current Likud government whose very party platform, quote, flatly rejects the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state west of the Jordan River. And unquestionably, you can blame the United States, whose erratic and unquestionably um, imbalanced handling of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has rightly earned it the suspicion of both sides in this conflict. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter who you blame, because wherever you place the blame, this one fact uh, was, again, this was 11 years ago that I was writing this, uh, was becoming increasingly obvious and undeniable, and that is that the two-state solution is a fast-fading dream. The problem, of, as I was, as I kind of brought it, as I explained it uh, back then, more than a decade ago, is that um, it's just a simple matter of demographics, right? That uh, 11 years ago, the number of Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea was roughly equal. 11 years ago, we were talking about the fact that, that e those equal numbers were going to shift and that very, very soon, Palestinians would outnumber Israelis. Well, we've already, we're already there. Palestinians already outnumber Israelis between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. 11 years ago, I said that barring some kind of demographic miracle, Israel will no longer be a Jewish majority state. And then, and that point hasn't arrived yet, but I think everyone who has looked at the demographics will tell you that it's, it's a uh, rapidly uh, approaching um, condition. So it's pretty simple, actually. <laughs> at that point, Israel will have two options, I said 11 years ago. Uh, it can either become an apartheid state in which a Jewish minority rules over a disenfranchised Arab majority, or it can become a single unified binational state in which Israelis and Palestinians live side by side with a single border, two peoples, one state. I was, as you can imagine, pilloried for that, for that idea, for that argument, 
I, the argument that I was making at the time was this isn't, uh, you know, some dream that I'm talking about. It's the reality already that Israelis and Palestinians already live in a single territory. They already have a single currency, a single market, a single political and economic ecosystem. And yes, it's true that Israel calls all the shots, but the idea of a Palestinian-Israeli confederation where two people share joint political and economic institutions while maintaining you know, a sense of semi-autonomy and preserving their cultural and religious distinctions is not so far fetched. But the point is, is that the, the alternative to that seemingly impossible idea was going to be um, an apartheid state. Well, that's what we have now. We have an apartheid state. And I think that any conversations, I think Professor Adslander is right. Let's not look to the past, let's look to the future. But to truly not look to the past means to put aside the four decades of failed negotiations for a two-state solution. The idea of a Palestinian state in what remains of historic Palestine is a laughable joke. And the notion that what we truly need right now is to get back to some kind of negotiating table in the hopes of rekindling the, the promise of a two-state solution is frankly offensive. As I've said repeatedly, and I'll just end uh, with this one more time, you cannot negotiate over how to split a pizza when one side is eating the pizza. So if we are gonna have a true, honest conversation about the future of Israel-Palestine, we need to stop with the fiction that we can somehow return to the possibility of two independent states. That dream is dead. And it's time to deal with the reality that already exists, which is two people sharing one state, but unfortunately a state in which one people uh, does not have the same rights and privileges. If we can start there, then we can get to what we all want, which is a binational state in which both Jews and Palestinians feel as though they are equal citizens. Thank you. Um, we're going to move next to Professor Shirin Hafez. So since my colleagues today have addressed the history or lack thereof and its ramifications of the Israeli occupation of Palestine, uh, I will turn to the issue of gendered violence <clears throat> and the impact that settler colonialism has had on Palestinian women. While living under Israeli uh, occupation has practically decimated the people of Palestine, causing immeasurable suffering, expulsion and exile, as well as economic and social devastation, women have been disproportionately affected by the structure of violence of this occupation. They have been denied basic access to, to education, work opportunities, uh, physical mobility, and the basic freedom and rights afforded to any human being living on this earth in this century. But as women, they have been subjected to particular forms of violence that not only debilitate them, but attempt to erase their traditional cultural and social role in Palestinian society. And this is what I would like to pay attention to in the next two minutes exactly, because I paid attention to the instructions to keep everything under three minutes. So I focus on the process of degendering in Palestine where Israeli settler colonialism has consistently worked not only to expel Palestinians from their land, but that has violently and often intimately worked to disrupt and undermine their gender and sexual identities. In the case of women, their bodies are often the target of sexual and physical abuse. Their reproductive rights and access to healthcare and birth care are often denied. Just to give you a rough statistic, 67 Palestinian women have been forced to give birth in checkpoints. And others have been shackled to their beds while giving birth in detention centers. Anyone here who knows the experience of giving birth and, and imagining being shackled to a bed, of course, can understand the horror of that experience. Palestinian women have been denied the right to their traditional domestic domain, a safe home where they can nurture and care for their families while simultaneously being marginalized from gaining access to employment outside the home. 
uh, or contributing to rebuilding their communities. Palestinian women have to contend with the fear and trauma of consistent but random raids and ransacking of their living space. So not only are the very Muted. Say again? You are muted for a minute, sorry. Oh, okay. So these frameworks that define their femininity and Palestinian identity are taken away from them by exile and the refusal of their right to return to their homes. Uh, but they've also been tasked with the unrelenting labor of caring for injured and maimed loved ones who have fallen victim to Israeli military bullets. The amount of labor that these women have to undergo in completely unpredictable and unsafe circumstances denies them the right to exist as human beings. This last factor is particularly debilitating given also the precarity of life under occupation. So to briefly conclude, I would like to point out that the occupation of Palestine has always been a human rights issue, but that it is today gaining solidarity among many struggling movements, including racial justice activism like Black Lives, indigenous and third world movements, and especially among feminist and queer groups that recognize that the freedom, justice, and equality for Palestine and the Palestinians are part of everyone's freedom, justice, and equality. Such structural violence as has been described can no longer be tolerated or perceived as over there because it creates forms of oppression and injustice that shape and legitimate oppression against women and people everywhere. For this reason, I am proud that the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies at UCR has unanimously endorsed the Palestinian Feminist Collective's pledge that Palestine is a feminist issue, as have hundreds of organizations across the US. And if you're interested in signing uh, to that list, please do contact me and I will send you the link. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um... Professor Hafez, um, we're going to turn now to Professor Jeff Sachs. Hey, everyone. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. So, so thanks to Mohammed for organizing this. Um, I, I wrote, I, I, I at, at some point I thought I was supposed to speak for five minutes. So I've written a five minute thing. Um, um, I do want to share, I'm always surprised, not surprised, but always, I, I would suppose, just immediately respond and become a bit angry and pissed off uh, the moment anyone starts to talk about this as a conflict, because it helps us to provide certain kinds of solutions that um, I, would, I would say reiterate the forms of violence that Shireen has been talking about and teaching us to think about. So I do want to read this piece and then we can have a conversation. It's, it's on an iPad, so I'm looking over here and you guys are here, so I'm in that weird Zoom space. So here we go. Uh, so I want to share firstly um, that this is not a conflict. Um, it is a colonial war against Palestinians and their lives, their being, their relationships, their sociality, their memory, their archival practices and their futurity. It is a war against the possibility of a Palestinian future. I want to underline that the recent Israeli acts of land theft and the further expansion of its sovereignty in Sheikh Jarrah, East Jerusalem and elsewhere point to a long and ongoing history of settler colonization, the bombardment of Gaza and the indiscriminate use of violence against civilian populations exemplifies the genocidal nature of the Israeli state and its practice now and in the past. And so this is not a conflict. It is part of the ongoing wars against indigenous peoples, against people of color and against black life. It is a colonial genocidal structure and practice and it should be understood and spoken of in these terms. So I want to underline that this is not a conflict and that it is also not a conflict between Jews and Arabs or between Muslims and Jews. What was made manifest in Gaza and not only there is the ongoing colonization and extermination of Palestinians. And I also want to underline that it, by which I mean Israel, what we might call the Zionist state and its juridical apparatus and form 
represents also the colonization of Jews and of Jewish life. Zionism, I want to underline, is not a Jewish ideology, form, practice, or mode. It is the translation of Judaism into the modern Christian and so-called secular terms for self-understanding and politicality. The legal subject, the historical subject, the subject of rights, and the subject of language. Zionism is, again, for Jews, the self-imposed taking on of these terms, an act that at once advances and masks as it seeks to provide an alibi for the settler colonial nature of the Zionist state. And so Zionism and the entity we still speak of as um, Israel calls for and makes socially manifest the end of Jews and Judaism. It is anti-Jewish and of course anti-Arab, anti-Muslim and anti-Palestinian. And so we must understand Zionism in particular as anti-Semitic in this precise sense. Any future then, a future of struggle and for life must entail the end of the Zionist state its dismantlement as an anti-Semitic, anti-Palestinian, racist, social, and juridical form. And so we must not call this a conflict because this obscures the social and historical form and reality which perpetuates the war, and I mean the war against Palestinian life, which Israel is. I want to share that what opens is a horizon of collective struggle against the settler colony and its terms, its form, its practice, its institution, its lexicon, including the word Israel, for example. It is a struggle that demands neither rights nor a state because these forms are colonial and racialist in nature and because they seek to absorb and contain social struggle and insurgency in the interest of the state and the law. If something, the state, right, and legality as social forms oppose what we ought to be struggling for, liberation and justice. It is a struggle that is nurtured by Palestinian acts of resistance resiliency, organization, and collective life and being. There are, after all, other ways of thinking about relation and sociality, about collectivity and form. And it is a struggle that must, and already is, allying itself with other struggles, the struggles of indigenous peoples, of the movement for black lives, of the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel, and the struggles against incarceration and against the police, beginning here at UC Riverside. Thanks. So I'll mute. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and finally, we have um, Fari Bazarin above. Okay, well, thank you for these wonderful panels. Um, I think that, you know, my role here as someone who's gonna end actually, you know, our, our uh, presentations is to look back into history. I'm a historian of early modern Middle East, uh, the Ottoman Empire and Iran. And I think, you know, looking back at history is really important. We shouldn't really, you know, uh, leave it out and going back as, as far back as we can because the history of um, these conflicts um, is very long and very rich, and maybe we can uh, learn something from it. So I study the development of early modern urban societies, legal systems, and social encounters in urban spaces among communities of faith, locals and foreigners, as well as men and women, in Eastern Mediterranean cities like Constantinople. My approach is how early modern empires accommodated religious and ethnic difference in an institutionalized legal setting that promoted peaceful coexistence, though not perfect and egalitarian in the modern sense, 
Historians have often defined the system as Ottoman cosmopolitanism or Safavid cosmopolitanism or whatever you have in the middle or the early modern period. So what were the limitations and why didn't it last? I also study violence and crime, urban and social upheavals, and the breakdown of the social order, as well as the rise of a surveilling state that reset the social and communal boundaries. Though there was a long history of peaceful coexistence between Muslims, Jews, and Christians in cities like Constantinople, where Muslims were a bare majority, only 40%, in Izmir, in Salonika, where Jews were 50% of the population, and in Jerusalem, well into the late 19th century. It was not perfect and did not mean equality for all or for non-Muslims. I'm interested in studying the level of interface accommodation and dialogue among communities of faith and its collapse and whether we can draw any parallels with the present situation. In other words, when do states and communities of faith lose stakes in maintaining a sort of informal but peaceful institutionalized social pact and ideology of religious and communal accommodation and opt for violence, discrimination, civil war, and ethnic cleansing. Can we see any parallels in the past with the present situation that is not limited to the Middle East? And certainly we have had it in the Balkans and in the rest of the Middle East, in Anatolia, as far as the Armenians are concerned. So in looking into the past, you know, I'd like us to kind of think about the present and maybe draw some lessons from it. But I don't think we should skip the past and forget about the implications of the past into the present and the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fariba. Um, that was um, a wonderful ending to this panel. And thank you all of you. Before um, we get started, I just thank you all of you for agreeing to participate um, and you know keep your, keep your remarks brief. Um, at this point, we would like to open up the, the floor to discussion and questions. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, message earlier, you can either raise your hand or you can put your question in the chat box. Um, I do uh, want to emphasize, since there are very many people, that you keep your questions brief um, and ask one question only. Uh, if later on there's time, we'll allow for second questions. Um, and I know this is a divisive and emotional issue, uh, and I do want to remind everyone to be respectful in how we frame these questions um, in the spirit of you know, being a, a university collegial community. Um, so I, I'm just gonna call on uh, Hanin, if you would like to ask your question, do you want to unmute yourself? And then after that, we will have no. Yes, hello, hi everyone. Um, uh, my question is for Dr. Alexander. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for your presentation. I had a comment about um, something he said earlier in the presentation. He said that we need to move on and we need to um, like not be stuck on the past. And so um, for me, what I wanna say is, you know, my grandfather was killed in Jerusalem. Um, his home was stolen from him by the Israelis. My father was jailed at 15. Um, so my question is, so are you asking me to move, to forget about that and to move on? And I have a question for you as well. So in that case, should we forget about the Holocaust? Thank you. Uh, hi, I didn't, I didn't get the student's name. Hanin? Yes. Oh, Hanin. Okay, great. So no, you know, they're, I'm not saying that at all, not even a little bit. Um, that these things should be forgotten about. Um, I'm saying from the practical point of view of negotiation and moving forward, that these discussions from both sides finding justifications for their violences uh, are, are not moving forward. It's, it's not how, uh, it's, it's not how, uh, it, it's, it's proven, it's, 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 it's not proven effective. And while, um, our individual histories give us justifications for what we do. Uh, it has tended to put us in silos and to emphasize the ethnic differences and justifications that have justified the violences that killed your grandfather. 
Um, I could give an example. Um, uh, in fact, involving the Sheikh Jarrah uh, uh, incident that, that, that ignited all of this. Um, you are all aware that Jews were ethnically cleansed from East Jerusalem, right, during 1948. And Sheikh Jarrah was a mixed and Jewish neighborhood at that point in time, 70 years ago. And I think it is not effective at all. Oh, but let me add to that. And Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from Haifa and relocated to Sheikh Jarrah and have been living there for 70 years. So if Jews are going to insist that they need to go back to 1948 and find those and, and take those houses back, we're not moving forward. We have to expect, ex, ex, understand the reality that's on the ground and try to move forward with what we have. And that's all I'm saying is that if you look at the, if, you, if the conversation is about your grievance and my grievance and your grievance and my grievance, then that's the conversation and the solution. And that moves very quickly to tit for tat violence, which moves very quickly to, to no solution in the future. So while I'm, of course, I'm, a, I'm basically a historian as Fariba is, and we can learn a lot of lessons from the past. But to, to harp on those grievances moving forward is uh, it, it, it's, we can do it. We're both, both sides are very good at doing it. Both sides are very good at using the media in order to propagate those stories. But in terms of practical effect, who's winning? Um, no, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, so my, my question is kind of directed to um, um, Mr. Aslan and uh, uh, Mr. Alexander. Um, Mr. Alexander, you said that Jews or Israelis need Arabs and Arabs need um, Israelis or Jews. Um, and something that I have found personally as a Jewish student is, um, especially with a lot of the recent violence is the kind of um, impact that has had on American Jewry. Um, you know, I'm terrified of wearing the keeper right now because of the um, um, pro-Palestinian, um, one of the violent um, things they did in Los Angeles and New York, and it might be a, um, but the question is, you know, I've seen in a lot of my peers who, who are also Jewish, that because of all this violence that's manifesting in the US and in Europe towards Jews is driving them to be more hardline and be more um, divisive. So my question is, you know, how do you approach, you know, these, these types of things? Because a majority of that is not the Palestinian movement at all. It's not um, what we're seeing manifest. But I feel that certain Jewish voices are being ignored or even brushed away from the Palestinian um, movement or, you know, try to give them a, a support. So I guess that's kind of the question, you know, how do we, um, you know, kind of assuage those fears of American Jews and, you know, can American Jews be part of the conversation without being um, attacked or vilified that I've kind of experienced when I've tried to reach out. Thanks. Uh, so I, I guess it was mostly directed to me. Um, violence and uh, extremism is an extremely effective way of stopping the conversation. Both sides are very well aware of it. I mean, I don't think it was much of an accident that Netanyahu lost the election and then suddenly this, there was, there was a, a push uh, for uh, more settlement in, in East Jerusalem. And that um, it, it, just, it, stops the, you know, it just stops the conversation. And it takes bravery to be able to move forward in the face of violence and, uh, yeah, and threat. Rabin knew it in 1993, 1994, and died for it. Arafat knew it. He knew he was on the, on the verge of civil war coming home saying, you're not, you know, there, it won't be from the river to the sea, but this, these are the, this is the contours of the new state. It took enormous bravery to do that. And so, yes, it's not, it's, it's, there is not gonna be a safe space in which to negotiate. There never is. And so 
it takes bravery to have that position. And, uh, it, and, and, you, and the bravery, I think, comes from the recognition that the alternative, which is to go into our silos, has been a disaster. It's just been a cycle of violence. So I think that's the realistic answer, which is that there's not, this is not going to, this, the conversation is not going to occur in a vacuum. Violence will always be able to potentially disrail it. And both sides have to recognize in one another that there are moderates that don't want it to be that way and that it doesn't have to be that way, that, the, that those extremes can be sidelined, that they don't, that the, that the megaphones don't have to control the conversation. And I'm going to let other people speak because I don't want to take over this panel. No, I, the only thing that I will add to that is that there is no chance that this situation can be resolved in any way without um, the active participation of um, American Jews, the vast majority of whom, the overwhelming majority of whom uh, do not support um, the, the Likud government or Bibi Netanyahu or the attempts to ethnically cleanse uh, East Jerusalem or the settlement uh, process. Um, I think that there's this strange um, kind of conception, I think amongst a lot of uh, non-Jewish Americans that part of American foreign policies um, uh, Im imbalanced approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, has to do with the um, influence of American Jews. It's quite the contrary. <laughs> um, if anything, you know, the, if I were to say, you know, is there is there a particular voting block in America that has been detrimental to any hope of resolving this um, conflict? It's American evangelicals. It's white American evangelicals. Um, so, as a Jew, I, I hope to God that your voice is going to, as a Jew who wants to see peace and who wants to see equal rights for Palestinians um, in Israel, Palestine, uh, it, it would be the most depressing thing in the world to think that you feel as though your voice um, can't be heard because you're afraid of the response to it without the voices of people like you. There really is no hope. Um, before we get to the question, the, the raise hands, uh, it's, uh, quite a bit uh, ago, Melody had asked about how do you recommend to show support for these issues or for Middle Eastern countries without fearing discriminations um, and employment issues? And I don't know if anyone wants to um, answer that question. Um, Ahlan, please go ahead. Yes, I could uh, talk about this. Um, it's very important to recognize um, the harassment can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the harassment and uh, the silencing of Palestinian vo voices and, um, you know, those voices that seek justice for and in Palestine, especially on U.S. Uh, campuses, actually, in academia. And one, I'm one of the people who actually have been <laughs> over and over harassed and um, attacked and uh, silenced, although I always, you know, resist and I don't give up. So I, I wanted to, to share this context that it is real, it, it, it actually exists. And if someone wants to know more about those practices by the Zionist lobby in the United States, uh, you could watch Al Jazeera's four um, uh, parts documentary called The Lobby. There is the lobby in the UK and the lobby in the US. Very informing and very important, especially for students who are trying to advocate. Um, but you could actually advocate, and I think some of my uh, colleagues have already stated that, which is through coalition building and through uh, actually collective work jointly in collaboration with other movements in the United States, like the Black Lives Matter movement, like uh, Union del Barrio, you know, immigration around immigration issues. We all have to be part of this intersectional coalition, actually, for justice whether it's for immigrants in the United States, whether it's for Palestinians, whether it's for blacks, whether it's for uh, uh, queers, etc., It's very, very crucial that we uh, work together as a collective and protect each other. I hope that kind of answered at least part of, of, of your concern. I have other things to comment on, but I will 
wait patiently for people to ask their questions, especially the issue of history. Um, does anyone else want to uh, add to that answer? No, so then um, the next person is Omar. Would you like to ask your question? Is that me? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the uh, stage that you've given me. Um, I have a question. First of all, um, how come that for such a big academic institution, there is no, uh, there's such an imbalanced panel about such an important issue? That's a big topic that I, when I'm looking on this situation, because when I saw uh, this whole situation going, I am originally from Israel. This whole topic is very hard for me to hear in a lot of situations, because that as stated by other people here, they have lost people on their side. And I do not condemn what Israel has done. But what I do say is that Israel has the right to defend itself. And as a former IDF soldier, I can tell you this, that we have done whatever we can to protect ourselves and the Jewish nation. And I am saying Jewish as not because that Israel was founded as a Jewish nation. But Israel has given everybody in its walls a chance and to protect them. And as I see here from Samaya, yes, Palestine has a right to defend itself. And again, I believe that Palestine, there should be a place called Palestine. Yes. But I do not believe in terrorism. I do not believe that Palestine, I do not believe that the Hamas should represent the Palestinians. I don't even think that they represent them. And I don't think that as a representation, they should use terror and shooting rockets against uh, the, the Israeli population. Thank you. So is that a question? Are we supposed to <laughs> respond or answer? Or? So I gave two. I, I gave two. First of all, how is that? Um, how is that that the panel uh, on this is not imbalanced? On this topic is not balanced on both sides. And I gave also an answer to all those stuff. If you would like, I can answer also questions that I see that are coming up in the chat. I have to say, I mean, I'm not going to respond to a lot of things you said, uh, especially you are an Israeli soldier, so um, which I call, I don't call it IDF because there is nothing defensive about the Israeli army. But I will definitely say that, uh, you know, for many people other than you, you know, who say Hamas, 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 it's actually um, a very um, intellectually lazy conversation and discourse. It's, it's intellectually lazy because of the level of discomfort that some people in the United States especially in academia feel to talk about Hamas as the symptom and not as the cause. And I think it's very crucial to go back and center the whole conversation around what actually happened and what is happening in Palestine. It's a colonial project. The logic of coloniality is not complicated. It's not untractable. It's actually very easy to follow. It, it's it's a, a logic that is based on the genocide of one nation to replace it with another nation. And that takes, of course, work because it's impossible, of course, to get rid of the indigenous nation. So it's a constant process, actually, of erasure of the Palestinian voices and the Palestinian existence that doesn't go away. And as I said, you know, the United States made, made it actually, thanks to the Israeli Zionist lobby in the United States, so difficult and so uncomfortable for people to talk about Hamas 
as the symptom of what actually happened. So let's center this conversation about the colonization of Palestine and not the other way around. Let's talk about the biggest terrorist in the area, which is the Israeli government. The state-sponsored terrorism is really the biggest issue here. It's the biggest issue when you have the fifth uh, uh, biggest military in the world fighting people who have, uh, you know, even, even with Hamas, I mean, the, the rockets they have, oh my goodness. The, 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 the incredible asymmetry in power dynamics in the region is just, it's laughable, you know, that when people talk about Hamas as if it were the problem. No, ter terrorism started with the creation of the state of Israel and before the creation of, this, of the state of Israel to terrorize a whole nation and ethnically cleanse them in a process of a constant genocide is terrorism. Let's talk about that because we can't solve any issue without actually addressing that. And, and there, there is also, I don't wanna, you know, um, talk, you know, like take the, the microphone away from other people, but there is also the issue of political economy of occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Why is it so convenient for Israel to actually control the West Bank and Gaza militarily, right? Without necessarily annexation. There is a very important political uh, uh, economic factor, which is the fact that it is an important testing lab for the military, the Israeli military industry. That's, that's something that no one actually talks about. But I, I advise you to read Jeff Helber's uh, book uh, on you know, manufacturing the occupation. Uh, I can get you the details in the chat. Uh, and he's an Israeli author who talks about the political economy of occupation. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think we can move on uh, from, from that to the next question from uh, Samia. You had your hand up. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to thank the panel so much for speaking on this issue. Um, so I had a question in response to an article that was published um, by Michael Alexander, but my question is not directed towards him because I don't want to give him a larger platform to spread misinformation. Um, so he says in the article that um, Zionism is legitimate because without a Jewish state, Jews have been slaughtered by millions without a, any other location for refuge. And I feel like this has been like a very common um, like excuse for Zionism uh, because it, it basically tries to show, well, you know, this is something that is extremely necessary because without it, you know, people would be dying. Like this is very, this is very necessary for the Jewish people. So um, I just wanted to ask, um, why is it that out of all of the countries in the world um, that Israel is the only one who has a right to exist? That conversation doesn't really exist for any other countries or any other like nation states. Why is it that it's Israel that has a right to exist and that there's always a constant push for Israel to be recognized by other nations? Once again, my question is not directed towards Dr. Alexander. Well, um, yeah, you may not want it to be directed towards Dr. Alexander, but it's it is uh, in reference to Dr. Alexander, and it, it is only right for him to be able to respond to you. So, well, I, I appreciate that you read the article, and I. Uh, I understand. I understand. Um, um, the legitimacy of both of the groups to me seems obvious. On the Jewish side, they keep digging up stuff out of the ground with Hebrew on it, and on the Palestinian side. The Dome of the Rock was built in 690 and has been the center of Palestinian national identity since that point in time. We might not have had the language for it at that point in time, but it's perfectly obvious that Jerusalem was the capital of a people and that the Dome of the Rock was and is the center symbolic location of that people. And I think that we're, we're facing a situation here in which is not unique 
to Israel's and Palestinians, but happens around the globe that multiple ethnicities are scrambling for a piece of land to call their own. Historically, we have a lot of historians on the panel. There was a period between 1914 and 1947 in which all of the great empires fell apart. The Ottoman Empire, which is the most relevant to this conversation, and the British, and the French, and the German, and the Habsburg. And when those empires fell apart, a lot of different ethnicities were left scrambling to get a piece of land so that they wouldn't get ethnically cleansed by other ethnicities. They were trying to figure out how to protect themselves. And Jewish, Pal and Jewish nationalism was born in that moment. Palestinian nationalism was born in that moment. Armenian, Azerbaijan, uh, you know, the, the Serbian nationalism kicked off that war. And so we have a situation, I actually, you know, I actually sort of agree to, to some degree with what Professor Sachs was saying, that the nation state model is a complete disaster. That the logic of building a nation state self-determined is especially an ethnically based nation state is that one has to clear out all the other ethnicities in order to build a majority and to put up walls. And so in, in theory, I actually agree, I agree with, with uh, some of what uh, Professor Sachs was saying. Yet this is the world system at this point in time. There are now 193 nations recognized by the United Nations as nation states. There are hundreds, if not thousands of national movements that are trying to get their own borders together so that they also are not ethnically cleansed. And uh, so I think that we should all understand that the problems, uh, what I said in the article is that Jewish nationalism, Zionism, is as legitimate and as problematic as every other nationalism. And that it's on Jewish people and Israeli people to figure out how to have your state and with as limited violence as possible and with as limited, with as limited policing of minorities as possible. And while I, I hope the Jews are sort of recognizing this as a, a moral problem and, a, and, a, and not an ethical problem, but also as a practical problem, I also hope that other groups are recognizing that the same, that, 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 that the system is a disaster and, but it's not one that uh, I think that we're going to be able to think through in this panel, although I very much uh, admire and respect uh, Professor Sachs's desire to see a moment in the, in the future in which these kinds of entities, this nation state model is not the model. And also Professor Oslan's uh, 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 notion of, of some kind of a uh, multi-ethnic entity I think that should be on the table. I think that's completely legitimate. I also think that possibly a two-state solution should be on the table because it's how the rest of the world is organized, basically by ethnic self-determined states. Could Israel, Palestine become a Switzerland? Oh, that would be amazing. Is it more likely to be a Lebanon? I think probably, but all of this needs to be talked about by the groups themselves that are on the ground, that are facing the violence, and in fact, that are, that are the perpetuating the violence. And so, the more we can sort of see one another as having legitimate points of view, the more likely I think we are to be able to get on one another's team and to be able to move forward. So I'm sorry that you know that you didn't want me to answer the question. And and uh, and I, let me just say before I, I'm going I'm to close my part of the conversation with this. I am so appreciative of the Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies faculty and the Middle East Student Center for engaging in a real conversation today because we are all, all aware of how these panels usually go. And we're all aware that we're always talking in silos. This is a very difficult conversation. People have been very brave to step up to the microphone and to be able to speak. Both sides, you don't wanna use the conflict that side, that's fine. <clears throat> People are, are, are angry, they're upset, they have family that are in the, in the arena that are being hurt and, um, this, the point of the university is to invite as many voices to get as possible to campus to express their points of view so that students can listen with both of the years that God gave them and come to their own conclusions about how to move forward in the future. And the fact that the Middle Eastern Student Center and the faculty of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies have invited other people into the conversation, I think, is extremely unique and I don't see it necessarily happening on, on, on our side. And so I hope that our side as it were, uh, so I hope that Hillel 
will continue to invite the Middle Eastern students to their panels, and maybe these things will be contentious. But if we're not having the conversation, go look at Twitter and TikTok. Who's having it? Nobody. This is our job. This is the hard work that we need to be doing. So thank you for hard, asking hard questions and for inviting me. And I really don't want to, I, I want to hear other opinions. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to? Maybe I can share a thought since, since I made a cameo appearance. So hi, hi everyone. It's nice to see you. And hi, Michael. Thank you for your responses and thoughts. Um, um, I do want to share a couple of thoughts and, and wow, I, just listening to everything, I'm sure it's a lot for everyone. Um, I guess the first the first thought that I would really like to share with the collective in this context addressing, and I, I'll just, how will I say this? I'll just address directly Michael, Omer, Noah, and anyone else out there, which is, I think, what is decisive in the Jewish community and various Jewish communities at the moment is to really reflect on the question, how do we account for our very significant attachment to a settler colonial state? Why is that the case? Why do we feel the need? Why does it seem to be the case that some Jews, certainly not most, have felt the need to reorganize the reflection on Jewish life. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm, you can see I'm hesitating saying this, and that's because I very much dislike the idea that a conversation about Palestine turns into a conversation about Jews. Um, because then you're talking about the colonizer when really you should be talking about how to liberate um, Palestine and Palestinian lives. And so I am, that's, that's the anxiety that I'm feeling right now to be quite frank with the collective. But I do think that on the part, insofar as Jews have a place in this conversation, it has to be, you know, how do we recognize ourselves as colonizers in this? How do we reframe the entire conversation that we have about ourselves and that we seem to like to force other people to have about us and them um, into a conversation that begins by recognizing that our role has been the role of being a colonizer and of being a settler there's nothing at all. I'm unlike practically everyone on the panel. I'm not a historian, certainly. So, but it's not at all controversial to say these things that in this context, um, in the Jews or Jewish people or Jewish communities, however one wants to use that locution, have been and continue to be colonizers and have been and have, I would say, have institutionally and socially created a context where they and their children and their nieces and their nephews are deeply attached to a settler colonial state that is deeply structurally, historically related to white supremacist settler colonial states across the planet. And that is amazing. And that, I think, in a, that's a different conversation, but I think, to be quite open with the group, that's what I'm trying to reflect on right now, um, is how do, we, how do we redo that? I think the second question that I would want to ask for the collective is, I don't think it's worth spending time. I'll be frank, you know, we only have so much time. It's not worth spending time having these sorts of arguments, I would say, with someone who's a Zionist. It's just not worth your time find your friends, find people who you trust and like and do things. Because what's happening now is that the whole structure is shifting. There's no longer a need to have a debate with someone who thinks of themselves as a Zionist, right? And that means a million different things for a million different people, right? My aunt, my uncle, my cousins, my nephew, I mean, everybody, right? I'm just speaking for myself right now right? That means a million different things, but there's no need to have that conversation. Um, what's urgent is to say, how do we move forward in my view, in my view, and I'm speaking right now from the point of view of how to articulate solidarity with Palestinians, how to move forward the question of the liberation of Palestine now, right? Which is a different question. On the score of that question, the question is, how do we create connections? How do we create conversations? How do we move with people? How do we act horizontally, right? There's no need to have this conversation, extremely banal, annoying conversation, 
right? And it's, 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 it's draining and it's awful, right? To have to speak to someone and, and I'm not even in this position, right? I would, it must be awful to be in the position of being Palestinian and having to justify to someone, say to someone, I suffered this. I have to put and justify my claim to suffering in a public space before you, the person who's colonizing me. That is awful. That is just awful. And so I think what is urgent is to say, how does one create horizontal connections? How does one move? This is why I was trying to emphasize relations to, you know, uh, indigenous organizations, indigenous communities, Black Lives Matter. How do we, how do we move that way? And it's it's not even how. Who am I to ask the question? It's happening. It's going. It's at a thousand miles an hour right now. You know, um, and so. I'll, I'll, I'll pause now since I'm sure a lot of other people would like to have, would like to have something to say other than, I, I guess I'll just close and say the horizon should be a horizon of liberation, of communality, of sociality um, that doesn't need to take into account the needs of the colonizer. Okay, thank the you. The colonizer thank can reflect on that. Thank too. you, Gil. I just wanna add as, as an indigenous person, right. um, it's, it's, it's also, you know, like the violence of the colonization itself, the violence that happens every day is usually combined with this distraction of forcing me to sit with my colonizer and have a conversation with my colonizer. This is what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. Exactly, and, and it's that the total distraction actually of our efforts to, as you said, forge a path for co-liberation of, of uh, my movement and other social justice movements. So thank you for saying that. Thank you. I think it's true. Yeah. Thanks. So, I'll. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for sharing your your voices, and I think for sharing what is um, a constant struggle for us to find the words that sort of acknowledge everyone and everything. And I think that we need to recognize that you know, even though we are academics, and this is our sort of you know, word spinning is the thing that we do. That it, that it is hard to find words that acknowledge multiple complex realities and our places in them. And I do want to remind everyone in the chat as well that, that these are there's a reason why this is divisive and emotional is because it is hard to articulate. It is hard to see each other. It is hard to see struggle. And I think that I just want everyone to take a deep breath and think about that before you put your type in, put your voices on and so on and, and so forth. Um, a lot of people are waiting to ask questions. Um, Rana, you're next. And there's a couple of questions in the chat also. So I'm gonna try and intersperse that so we can keep things moving. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna begin by thanking, um, thanking the organizers for this conversation. And I wanted to especially thank um, Dr. Shirin for mentioning the PFC the statement um, which uh, Dr. Ahlam and myself are a part of, and I've, I'm actually going to, I've in the dropped in the um, chat box, the statement that was put together by the Palestinian Feminist Collective, and you're welcome to, um, to read it and sign it. I have two questions. The first is for um, Dr. Sachs and Dr. Ahlam on the notion of the historical present. And this isn't like an intellectual question in terms of those of us who are doing research on Palestine in Palestine and really centering a decolonial method to our research. So if you could speak to, I, I too am not a historian, um, but how do we recognize the kind of limitations or the possibilities of the historical present in the work that we do? And the second question is for um, Professor Alexander. So recently UCR Life did an article on anti-Semitism um, and the rise of anti-Semitism, which is something that definitely is not unique to the moment. And it is a conversation that continues to happen, unfortunately. But I wanted to ask if there was any conversation, um, given the moment that this article came out, um, around the suffering and pain as centering Palestine and Palestinians, because um, I know that you gestured towards a conversation in terms of um, collaboration in your response around anti-Semitism, but I don't know, I haven't seen the university make a statement in terms of say the atrocities that happened in Gaza recently. So I wanted to ask you if there was any conversation between you and um, the authors or the kind of the framework that informed the article that which was ultimately published and then uh, distributed to the university. 
Um, so if Dr. Ahlam, Dr. Sachs, if you don't mind speaking in terms of like intellectually, politically, the work that we do. And then uh, Dr. Alexander, if you don't mind mentioning, just kind of situating the conversation on anti-Semitism in relation to this particular moment, I think I would really appreciate your, your feedback on that. Okay, um, I guess I'll start. Uh, thank you, Rana, and thank you for, uh, you know, focusing and centering the Palestinian Feminist Collective and our work uh, in terms of connecting with other struggles. To answer your question, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, you know, because I already addressed some of it, is um, how convenient, how convenient it is for, for the oppressors, for the colonizer to say, move on, right? Just move on and don't talk about history. But how can I do that? How can I do that when any solution has to be based on justice? You see, peace cannot be achieved without justice. How can you actually come to the conclusion of a just uh, solution if you don't know um, the particulars of history? And history is not complicated at all. History is really straightforward. There are huge amount of information about history. Some, a lot of it is hidden, as I said, and controlled by Israel for a very clear, uh, obvious reason, which is to say, let's move on and to avoid actually the, the discriminating evidence that could you, be used against the whole idea of the creation of the state of Israel. So as indigenous, I teach research methods for the, my graduate classes. I just finished actually uh, a graduate class in uh, qualitative research methods since you talked about the scholarly aspect of it. And we actually study indigenous approaches to research. We actually read a book by Smith called Decolonizing uh, uh, Research Methods, right? And, and, and a, an important part of it is actually centering the historical aspect, the historical narrative, oral histories of the indigenous people. That's like in the heart of any research project, even if it was scientific, even if it was about the biology or about plants, etc., There is an erasure, not only of Palestinian indigenous voice in research, but actually across the world of any indigenous voice. How much do we know about uh, research approaches of our indigenous population in the United States, for example? H how much? We don't read about that. It's, it's, we, we have no idea about their approaches or their knowledge production or anything like that. And this is why I started my whole presentation around that concept, the concept of decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production. Um, so I, I, I go back and say like, without understanding of the history and its consequence, we can't have a solution. And for me, just to say, and I, and I actually have to leave very soon, but just, just to emphasize the solution, I, I do believe that we should have a one, state, I am one of the people who definitely believe there is no other way out except a one state solution, although I don't think it has to be a binational state necessarily. Why? We have a very good example from South Africa. It doesn't have to be the exact same one because of course there are some intricate, you know, more details in, in the context of Palestine. But we Palestinians are generous enough to actually and hospitable enough to allow the Jewish nation that now exists in Palestine on Palestinian land to share the land with us, but of course on principles of total fairness and equity, not as second class citizens, and not as uh, 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 whatever, you know, self-determining entity inside the larger, you know, uh, uh, state of Israel, etc. It actually has to be dissolving of what we have now, the colonial system now, and construct one that is based on justice for everyone with one man, one vote, or one woman, one vote, etc. I see things in a very clear way and in, it's not necessarily complicated and we have historical examples to talk about that. And lastly, just to add to the point because I still people actually conversing about, you know, collegiality, which actually is a very problematic term when we link it to civility, the civil discourse, which has been used historically as um, anti-indigenous, you know, discourse to actually empower the colonization projects around the world. But anyway, 
this is exactly for Palestinians to ask us to sit with a Zionist is exactly like asking black people, for example, to sit with the Ku Klux Klan. It's, it's not very different, really. Don't ask me to actually have a conversation with my oppressors. Thank you. Um, Jeff, before you um, say anything, I just wanted to say um, thank you to um, Dr. Mahta said for coming um, before, since I know she has to leave early. I'm sure there are a lot of um, requests on your time these days, um, and we really appreciate your presence at the panel um, and hope to see you again in person um, on campus. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. So, so I can share a thought. So I think I would like to start off where Ahlam started um, and share, you know, I think one can maybe try to think about anti-Semitism um, in relation to a kind of decolonial knowledge production practice, which I, and I want to thank you, you know, I want to thank the person who asked the question for the question. And I want to thank Ahlam for your response, because it helps me to think about how can we think about the question of anti-Semitism in a different way entirely, which is to say, in the context of the so-called conflict, it's, you know, in my view, used as a kind of a wedge in order to create, um, I would say, active sympathy for the state of Israel, and at the same time, um, to destroy possibilities of moving forward in different ways. And so I think we can shift the entire frame and say, you know, we should think about the history of anti-Semitism in relation to the history of the formation of racial conceptual of racial conceptualization in Europe, beginning at least in Europe's 12th century. Everyone should be reading Cedric Robinson, Black Marxism, um, on racial capitalism, and so on. And one of the things he points out is that racial forms are originating in the 12th century. In Europe, and a decisive text to read, and y'all have to forgive me. I'm I'm not a, a religious studies person either, but y'all should read Aquinas, and see what Aquinas has to say about so-called Saracens um, and all of these bizarre, all these categories that are getting invented in Latin in the 12th and 13th century, actually, um, and morph in the in the you know in the colonial period after the Crusades. Um, in Europe into the more racialized categories that we're all familiar with, right? And so I think if we can think about anti-Semitism in relation to that history, um, which is to say the history of racialized formation in Europe, um, then we can say, okay, let's speak about anti-Semitism, but there has to be a, a very sharp cut made with the Zionist state, which is to say one cannot be a Zionist or one cannot be on the side of a settler colony and um, want to be critical of anti-Semitism because those, the, the logic of the settler colony and the anti-Semitic logic are homologous, right? And so I think in order to speak, say critically about anti-Semitism, to be opposed to it, one has to be opposed to the settler colony that shares a logic with it. Um, and so I, I will share, I do forget the exact language of the question. I hope I'm, I hope I'm responding to it in some in some uh, in some way and in some fashion in this conversation that we've all been experiencing together, um, that's 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 what I'll share on the, on the anti-Semitism score. Other than to underline what I tried to share in my talk, which is, of course, that Israel, which is I think nothing more than a war against Palestinians, is anti-Semitism, um, and so. I'll close out. I don't want to take up any more time. I'm sure other people have questions or thoughts they want to share. It was Rana who asked. Hi. Thank you for your question. Um, Michael, did you want to also respond to one? Uh, sure. I mean, very briefly. Um... I don't know the, the decision-making behind statements put out by the, the, the chancellor. Uh, I don't think the chancellor has put out any statement regarding anti-Semitism. Um, the, the, uh, the, the UCR News contacted me and asked for an interview on the issue because there were incidents in the United States. And I think that they, they try to cover, you know, when there was anti-Asian sentiment, there was some kind of an article that was written at that time. 
and probably some kind of a statement by the chancellor. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I simply don't, you know, know the rhyme or reason why statements come out or articles come out. I personally am not necessarily uh, a big fan of statements and things. I, I'm not sure how practical they are. I think they are uh, often silo building. So I, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. I think we should move on to a, a, another topic. Um, Shadi, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just first want to say that, uh, you know, I'm a UCR uh, alumni and uh, one of the co-founders of the Middle Eastern Student Center back in 2013, 2014. Um, so, you know, I'm very happy to see that the Middle Eastern Student Center is continuing to do great work and to, um, you know, give a, vi a voice to Middle Eastern students and to have um, you know, constructive panels like this. So, you know, great job to the MASC. And, you know, again, I'm a proud Highlander to uh, come back and, and uh, you know, attend one of these panel discussions. Um, you know, my question generally is in terms of um, engaging with, you know, uh, American Jews on this topic, you know, throughout the United States, right? Because um, when I was on campus and you know, part of Students for Justice in Palestine and, and helping co-found the Middle Eastern Student Center and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of the focus was to educate uh, the campus about the topic of Palestine. And, you know, we would get a lot of American Jews who, you know, were very, uh, you know, they're like, hey, I'm just, I'm Jewish. I don't really, you know, know much about it, except, you know, I have some family in Israel or, you know, I did birthright or things like that. Um, and whenever we would engage with, you know, Highlanders for Israel or try and have some sort of discourse, you know, to them, it seemed more like a, um, an annoying task that they had to do to engage with us, that it was something like they could do for a few hours and then go back home and, and, you know, focus on other things. So, so just generally, just to be direct with my question then is because of the differences in the dynamics, right? You know, like students who engage in pro-Palestinian activism, you know, are put on lists like the Canary Mission and websites like that, and their activism is punished, while students who have to respond to pro-Palestinian activism, uh, it, it's more just like a, a something that they feel is a, is a chore. So my question is, like, how do we bring in American Jews or people who, uh, are unaware with the topic in a constructive way that that doesn't, you know, degrade into a, you know, tit for tat, like, well, he said, she said, or this happened, this happened. So, I, you know, it's, it's more generally for how do we keep the conversation going forward um, when there are, you know, disparities in terms of like the activism that people do. So I don't know if my question makes sense, but again, I just want to, you know, thank everyone for, uh, you know, attending and, and participating and again, you know, proud Highlander and I'm glad to see the Middle Eastern Student Center uh, continuing its great work. Thank you. May I uh, give a brief comment on that? Uh, you know, when I was thinking about this panel, having this panel, I, uh, yeah, I already uh, predi predicted this kind of uh, voices and, 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 you know, uh, ideas, thoughts, um, different languages to, um, um, to name certain, uh, you know, things and all these claims and, and facts, mix uh, opinions and facts are mixed. Um, emotions and ideas are mixed, um, our own identities and our own projects are mixed. And this is great, actually. Uh, we, you know, uh, the fact that we are now speaking up and listening to uh, both faculty members and also some of the students, I think this is, um, this should be not the last. Uh, this is not, I think this should continue. And I, I know that, you know, uh, students, here at UCR, we have Justice for Palestine, Hillel, uh, 
uh, association, faculties teaching different subjects related to Middle East, State of Israel, you know, Jewish history, Middle history, and so on. But we hardly talk to each other. Uh, I think it's it's a, it's about how we can listen to the other side. We could have to start to listen to the other side. Uh, it's my it's very very hard. Uh, it's just like one me and my wife or you know you and your neighbor basically right we 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 fight um maybe we fight because we are brothers and sisters uh i you know i want to emphasize again the notion of jewish christians muslims uh, basically share com common values and share histories share forefathers share some core values like peace and justice uh, you know, prosperity, um, living well, getting some jobs. And I, everybody it has the same concern. Um, and I think that this is the place. And we don't, we, we cannot shut anything. So we have to speak up our mind, our voices, students, faculty members from whatever, uh, you know, from whatever perspectives. And I think this is great. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, at least we're doing this and uh, we will continue on this. I just want to respond to Shadi matter, you know, um, that's why um, uh, students uh, as well as faculty members, it's maybe not as, you know, as inclusive as we wish, as some says, you know, but at least this is a really, really, really um, wonderful opportunity to start with. Uh, thank you. I just want to rest uh, uh, to comment on Shadi Matter. Thank Can you. Can I just thank you. say something? Um, I wanted to add something. Okay, go ahead, please, please. Yes, so I also wanted to kind of coming back to uh, the point that Mohammed made about, you know, the peaceful coexistence of three, these three communities of faith. I think that's, you know, an important place to start. And fortunately, I must say that there are lots of projects right now happening. So one outcome of, you know, these conflicts is that a lot of people get challenged just the way we are and starting, you know, um, conversation. I think academia, the classroom, UCR, these are really great places. And people are really looking into the past, into the, you know, the historical past and examples of people like us, you know, who in the 13th century Iberian Peninsula or in Constantinople or Salonika, we're really looking to reach out, establish those connections, whether it's through the communities of faith or neighborhoods, that has happened in the past. And unfortunately, you know, violence has taken over at some point. But that's not necessarily true all the time. And I think, you know, on a, on a more positive maybe point, we need to do that work, you know, not just look into the origins of the Palestinian conflict, but really look into the past, as Jeff pointed out, as at how these three communities of faith have lived together historically for centuries, right? And of course, violence has been part of it, but it has been a minor part of it. And I really think that it is through people really going through you know, these internal changes within them intellectually uh, in each community to challenge the dominant paradigms. We need to do that. It has happened in the past and it's upon us to sort of continue the conversation because we cannot stop here. It's, it's just beginning in my opinion. Um, there was a question from Sandra, but I think Raza has already answered it in the from the chat. So we should move on to Kyle. It is an important question, and I'm, I'm happy to just state it because it'll take five seconds. The question Go is, ahead, please. You know why why continue to refer to Hamas as a terror um, organization? I, now I did not refer to it as a terror organization, but I referred to its actions as terrorism. There's a lot of uh, to me, unnecessary debate and conversations about what exactly terrorism is. It's not complicated. The indiscriminate use of violence against non-combatants is terrorism. That makes the actions of Hamas terrorism. It also makes the actions of the IDF terrorism. Kyle? Hey everyone, sorry I'm a little short of breath because my cat was just biting my feet and I had to chase him to another room for a second. Um, thank you all uh, to the panelists and those everyone asking questions. Um, uh, I just sort of want to begin with what uh, Aslam said and sort of serves into, sort of feeds into my question. I apologize if this is a little long-winded, um, 
But, um, and then what Fariba, what you were just talking about actually fits in very well with what I was gonna ask. Um, so I live right next to the Box Spring Mountain um, and am constantly reminded from an indigenous perspective of the fact that this is Kawila and Luiseno sort of sacred land um, and as an occupier myself, but it sort of brings me back to my own sort of ideological internal identity formations in my own familial history. So on the one hand, sort of the, the khalaf, um, I, I, I like to imagine that part of my own identity as um, my, my father being part Tamazir, part Arab, and I like to imagine myself somehow as the sort of descendant, uh, sort of in my mytho mythological imagination of Fatima and Sumer and like those and Kadima. And on the other hand, um, I, well, I should also add that I'm part Greek and my, my Greek family was expelled from uh, Smyrna. Um, and so um, there's that side that's very easy for me to reconcile and sort of going to the question of of digging deeper though, my, my Belgian family, and this is something I've never admitted publicly before in an academic context, but my great grandfather on my maternal grandmother's side owned a coffee plantation in the Belgian Congo. And we have photographs. And there's a photograph of my grand, great grandfather being carried by four slaves on, on a beer or a litter a hammock. Um, and, when I confronted my Belgian relatives about that, they said, you know, it was an honor for them to carry him. And I look at these pained expressions in the photographs and I think that's, that's not possible at all. That's a total social construct. So the reason I asked this is a bit long winded, but coming to terms with my own sort of the competing selves and multiple identities within me um, and reconciling those and having to, to share those um, and that painful legacy. Um, I wonder as a scholar of antiquity, uh, and this is sort of my question for Fariba, um, has to do with our sources in antiquity and something that hasn't been mentioned yet today, which is of course the Roman imperial uh, a conquest of the city of Jerusalem and that particular event, which of course with the Arch of Titus became an icon in many, in many ways in the sort of 20th century and part of uh, the narrative with the founding of Israel. And um, also sort of uh, this, on the other hand, the sort of the period of the Hellenistic world and sort of on the one hand, we can idealize it with um, this imagined sort of like William Tarn writing in the 20th century, imagining the sort of community of God and all these different peoples living side by side peacefully in the wake of Alexander's conquests which are sort of acts of violence, but you have these interesting sources like the letter of Aristeus to Philocrates, which sort of contains within it uh, a letter from King Ptolemy to the priest uh, Eleazar of Jerusalem, sort of trying to find some, some sort of peace uh, and coexistence and sort of discussing how the Jewish peoples could live side by side with ironically a colonizing Hellenic force in Egypt that was exploiting the Egyptian peoples and all of the problems of that. But I'm sort of, my question for Fariba, very long winded, so I really apologize, but is sort of how do, how might we think of in the sort of history you're describing sort of medieval and that period and earlier periods with this coexistence, a sort of possible reconciliation of ideologies of peoples living side by sides historically and, the, and sort of what we, what, we, what we might learn from that in terms of moving forward with the, with the conflict. I'm sorry if that was long-winded, but. Um. Fariba, you're muted. <clears throat> well, thanks so much, Kyle, great points. Um, I'm teaching a grass seminar right now, and we are discussing these very issues and themes. And I think, you know, this kind of long durée discussion, of course, you know, is possible through our classrooms, grad seminars, undergrad. So I would be more than happy to invite you to one of my seminars and exchange ideas. But, and I'm doing some research on exactly that, you know, the interfaith connections between the Jewish community and between the Muslim community in Constantinople through the law courts. And it's really fascinating how there's certain moments where there's really an attempt to reach out, 
you know, you have Jews coming to the uh, Muslim court, you know, with, with, with their disputes, you know, a woman wanting to get divorced and not being able to obtain it in her own court and trying to try it in the Sharia court and then reaching out between the Muslim judge and the, um, the Jewish rabbi, a sort of conversation how to settle these disputes. I mean, these are really rare moments historically. You can find them everywhere, I bet you. But I think these are moments where it's, it's the civil society. I'm putting a modern terminology on it, reaching out. It's, it's at the communal level, it's at the neighborhood level. It's happening, I'm sure, in Israel. Neighbors reaching out to each other where you have heightened violence. It happened in Bosnia. But I think we need to highlight them. It's true, you can argue these are rare moments. You know, it doesn't translate into state action, maybe the opposite. But I also think that this idea that, you know, these three communities cannot live together. There is a constant, you know, violence that, you know, these communities are inevitably forced into. I think that's also um, a misrepresentation of history, right? And there's a stake in kind of upholding that, you know, whether we are talking about Muslims, Jews, and, uh, and Christians, or we are talking about Turks and Greeks. So as a historian, it is my responsibility to also bring that documentation forward if I can find them. And that's what I'm engaged in right now, which I think is very relevant to what's going on. That's, that's a long answer to your question. Does anyone else have something to add to that? Uh, no, uh, we're pretty much out of time. Um, so I think we're gonna, wrap up and I, I do know that we had planned to have you know if there was an opportunity for the panelists to say anything to each other or to offer some final thoughts so maybe we'll move to that um and then um you know thank you all for attending thank you all for participating um and hope to see you soon at another event thank you so much everyone Thank you, guys. Thank